Hello and welcome to Big Nation FM's What's Done in the Dark Will Always Come to the Light Edition. My name is Tina Mack and yes, I'm talking about LMPD, Louisville, Kentucky's baddest gang. And I can say that because I'm from Louisville, Kentucky and they've been abusing people for years. Not going to do a lot of talking tonight, just want to play some audio from an interview with a lieutenant that was part of the raids. And he says that they were not debriefed on Breonna Taylor's home. And while they were raiding the Elliott Street homes, they heard over the radio that someone had been shot. Let's listen in. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Sergeant Jason Vance, the Little Metro Police Department's Public Integrity Unit. Today's date is Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. And it's um, 1,300 hours. We are here present at 3672 Taylor Boulevard at the Public Integrity Office. This is a recorded statement uh, from Lieutenant Del Massey. The statement is referenced to PIU case number 20-019. Present with me is Lieutenant Del Massey. Attorney is not present. And Sergeant Jeremy Roof of the Public Integrity Unit. Lieutenant, are you aware that this statement is being video and audio recorded? Yes, I am. Does this meet with your approval? It does. Sir, please state your full name and spell your last name. Uh, Larry D. Massey, Jr., M-A-S-S-E-Y. And, sir, what's your code number? 2459. And where are you currently assigned? Uh, SWAT, Special Operations Division. And how long have you been in that unit? Uh, in the unit, three and a half years. And how long have you been with the department? Nineteen and a half. Are you under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or any other intoxicants at this time? No, I'm not. Are you taking any kind of medication that would affect your judgment or your ability to think clearly? No, I'm not. So this form, you know, covers multiple things. We're going to bypass this because it doesn't cover this. Because the statutory requirements of KRS 67C.326, I'm obligated to advise you that this is a criminal investigation, not an administrative investigation. However, you are not the subject of this investigation. Knowing this, are you willing to give us a statement this yes, time? Yes, I am. Okay. So um, th what this is a reference to is that, um, you know, we had an officer of all shooting on March the 13th um, at 3003 Springfield Drive uh, in the 3rd Division. And as a result, you know, reviewing body cam footage and also just knowing, you know, the course of investigation is that obviously SWAT responded to that location and cleared it, secured it, if you will, uh, prior to PIU's arrival. And reviewing some of the documentation provided to us by CID, um, we did not receive a operations plan. So one of the questions we wanted to see if you guys were I know you all had a briefing before the search warrants because there was multiple search warrants served that night. Is it some of the information that you all gathered from the briefing and what information were you all provided before that night? Okay, um, we got to backtrack. So we got information on these warrants probably about a month, a month in advance. It's going to be a pretty much large scale operation. Um, Sergeant Cassie and Sergeant Burns are kind of the points on. So what kind of happens now with us is that when we plan our high risk warrants, they'll call me. Um, get with the sergeant. The sergeant kind of gets to the planning phase, and we kick it down to our um, officers to do the recons and start our planning process, for that matter. Uh, they had a meeting about a month prior, um, and they brought up multiple locations, and our guys advised them, hey, we need to take this slower. You know, we're not going to do eight warrants in one night. Simultaneous warrants, we're out of that business now just because of the inherent danger of it, doing two locations at once. How about we do two this day, two the next day, and so on and so forth. Um, and there was mention of the address on Springfield in an email sent to Joe Cassie. Um Fast forward to the week before, so they give us two addresses, both of them are on Elliott, uh, one's a vacant, we're across the street from each other. Uh, Detective James comes in the night of the warrant to do the briefing. We brief both of them up on his end and our end, so he'll give us the intel behind his case, you know, what he's learned, what should we encounter there. Easily enough for us, we know the address on Elliott, it was our fifth time, I think, in 18 months doing it, so we have a pretty good idea of what that house is like, and the vacant next door, we dealt with that as well. He goes through his whole brief. Um, giving us his intel on his side, so then we go through our briefing, our tactical planning. So what we've done uh, since going full-time is we've completely overhauled how we plan warrants. Back in the day, we would take a lot of detective information and take it as, as golden, not anymore, because so often there's no kids, there's no dogs, we're told, there's kids and dogs. So we have an exhaustive recon process that we go through. 
Um, he made mention of another address, 2605 West Ali that night. Um, May and said something defective. We're going to do that later. Like a later date, so I took it. At no point did I ever hear the word Springfield mentioned in the briefing. Someone else may have. I never heard it. It was never said that, hey, we're doing any other warrants. We rode out to go to Elliott with the understanding that we were the only ones doing warrants that night. Okay? We're looking on scene, so they're across the street from each other, so it's kind of a tactical dilemma. Jeremy can attest to this. You're trying to play this house while you're working this house. There was like 10 or 12 people in this house. So I'm in the Bearcat in the middle of both locations, kind of just surveying what's going on. Um, we're about, I don't know, two or three minutes into working the door. We're calling people out. And on our SWAT 1 channel, we hear shots fired. Um, so we're like, wait a second, shots fired. Is everybody good? My guys get on the radio. I believe Aaron's like, yeah, we're good at the breach point, whatever. So then I believe a Sergeant Luke Fawn comes on our SWAT channel and said, yeah, Springfield gives the address. We get an officer involved shooting. Um, I'm in the Bearcat. So we kind of gather our bearings. So we're like, what are you talking about? You know, again, back to the point is we had no idea they were doing a warrant at the same time we were. Gather our bearings, um, kind of get up a QRT together. I know it was me, Sergeant Burns, Sergeant Cassie, Sergeant Hogan. I know Scott Walker was driving the Bearcat. I believe Chris Baker. There was about 10 of us that, that went over to Springfield. So we leave Ali, or excuse me, Elliot, get to Springfield. Um, there was some kind of, as these chaotic situations unravel, like the address they gave at first was a different address than they were actually at. So it took a little bit to get there. We had to actually ram the Bearcat through a chain link fence because it was just a one way in, one way out kind of street. Get there, um, and we pulled the Bearcat up pretty much to the one side of the apartment, the driver's side door. And I see to my right, a roll of police cars, and what I would have to guess would be 20 officers with long guns pointed at directly at the, the, the door, the sliding glass door. Um, I believe I see Lieutenant Hoover and Lieutenant Shaw just kind of in the area. So uh, we're kind of getting our plan together. As we're rolling up, we're getting intel, hey, the shooter's been 10-15, he's, he's, he's over here. Um, he said there's a female inside or something something like that. But, again, as Katie cause these things are, you know, the exact verbiage. But to that effect, I was really confident that there was not going to be any more resistance in the house, but we were trying to go check on the possible female, right? So it's preservation of life. Um, so I kind of talking to Major Shy and said, Hoover, my man, get over here by cover, because when I initially get there, as I'm looking through that sliding glass window, our initial thought is, oh, they're shooting out the window at the police, right? That Or at the door, I should say. Get some more intel. Um, I send a team up there, and I kind of stay behind the Bearcat. I tell all the patrol officers, check your rifles up, because they're still literally just pointing and they don't know what they're pointing at, more or less. I mean, the target identification, there's there's nothing to point at because there's curtains and everything else. You're just pointing a gun, just pointing a gun. Um, get a plan together. They roll up. Go on the one side. I believe they throw um, our throw bot. Um, Ricky. Ricky, yeah. Ricky inside. And they can see down the hallway, they can see a person down. I mean, it was plain as day. So they go in, search it, possibly any more, hurt people, whatever. Um, come back out. Give the all clear. The patrol officers were holding something on the three side. They were holding down another window. There was a, a white male at it. They had him at gunpoint, but I'm like, that's a different apartment. So that guy back there is fine. So obviously chaotic scene. Um, do the best you can when you get there. Try to slow everything down and just you know, try to provide the best service we could and help them as best we could. Um, but getting back to the planning phase, we had no idea they were going to be at that apartment that night. And as far as the information that you guys received, did you all receive the search warrants? I mean, yeah. What will happen is they'll do a risk assessment matrix uh, in the search warrants. Uh, we get copies of those. I've gone an extra length now where I make them uh, require them to give me a hide a number for, for the extra layer of safety because in the past we've done warrants for different units where multiple units were looking at it and unbeknownst to us because we're a support unit, so hide a number. Um, some some detectives go above and beyond. We have a PowerPoint that they'll do that we've supplied to them, hey, that gives information. But it, at the very least, the risk, ass risk assessment matrix, um, copy the HIDA number and the actual search warrant affidavit, which, what's required. And just for the, the tape, I mean, a HIDA is a de deconfliction site. Correct, yes. Deconfliction site to ensure multiple units aren't planning a police action at the same location. It's meant to stop blue on blue violence or blue on blue shooting. And, and during the course of your all's preparation, what significant, if any, information that you all learned beyond what was provided by CID? Um, this case, not so much because we've done the houses before on Elliott. We've done it literally four or five times in 18 months. Um, so we knew we were going to get 
they provided some information. I think that the door may be barricaded, but through us going by, hey, we see people in and out freely. We were getting updates as we were rolling there. There's people in and out. I mean, it's a very hot area, the 24 block alley. So nothing um, stood out other than there could be possible follow-on warrants later on down the road, um, but nothing about the two locations we were given that night, Elliot. It was just a house we've done before to make it. As far as Springfield goes, um, you know, once you make it over there and you guys, you know, make it safe and secure it for us, PIU, um, you, you know, how, I don't know, how long are you going to see after that occurred? After we call the house all clear? Secure it, yeah. Wow, man, we didn't stay long after, probably 10 or 15 minutes. Just long enough to where I knew that everybody there was going to be safe. Like there was no no other threats to the police or civilians for that matter, and that they kind of had what they needed. Um, I I said some a couple of things to Major Shy and Hoover, I believe I was like, hey, we should probably get out, escort officer figure out who did what. But I said our role is the tactics parts out. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stay part of that. But man, y'all should probably consider a couple of things. We're leaving. So probably ten or fifteen minutes. Now, did you learn any information as far as, you know, that incident at, on Springfield after you, you guys came out and why you still remain on Springfield? Oh, yeah. Um, so, originally, when I was there, um, Detective Cosgrove was providing the best intel and best information out of anybody, hands down. Um, he had a rifle slung. So, I assumed, just having a rifle slung, that he was there after the fact, okay? So, I know Mattingly's involved in it. Um, while we're on scene, we learn that Cosgrove's involved in it. Like, I had no idea he was part of it. And then through the course of, you know, Sergeant Byrne will attest to this, a couple of guys went to neighboring apartments to ensure there was no other casualties due to the gunfire. And I know at one point um, they were pointing at the window, and or Detective Hankinson looked over and kind of made a motion like, like that, like tapped his chest almost to say, yeah, that was me type thing. So as we were on scene, it became pretty apparent to us what we thought happened um, as far as what happened initially at the breach point and then where those those however many rounds were fired through the, the windows and the doors. You said you learned that Cosgrove was involved. Did he tell you that it was, or you were you told from other, another person? I was told by somebody else because I was like, I said, then I said, I was like, man, get him out of the mix because he was still in the mix doing stuff. I was like, get him separated from everybody. He Who told you that? I don't remember. I man, I, I really don't. And was he removed from the scene? I, I don't think so. Okay. And I don't like I said. So we're all there, and it's obviously hectic, like I said before. But I, I do remember saying, "Hey, separate him. He's involved. He's, he was way too up in the mix, you know." It's hard to work. Lt, going back to the briefing, uh, I know there were two. Uh, on Elliot, they talked about one on Ali, and it was decided Ali would be done at another that time. Was my uh, there was no mention of Springfield. Uh, through our investigation, we've learned uh, up to this point from the information provided by CID that Springfield was directly related to Elliot. Mm -hmm. uh, is it common? With the amount of warrants you do for CID and other other, I guess units, if you have a a site that is linked to other other sites, would that be brief during that time? Oh, 100 uh, percent. We should we should have knowledge of what they're doing. Um, and kind of to go, not to get too caught in a, a rabbit hole here. Since going full time, the team has come millions of miles. It's not because of me. It's because the guys. We we treat safety. Very important, right? So, like, simultaneous warrants, bad business. Something goes down like we just saw, who's there to provide armor? Um, our priorities, like, our priorities are people, right? So, like, to us, we need to be briefed on everything, but at the same time, like, there's been some understanding in narcotics and in CID that we're not going to rush in to get dope. We're not, we're not going to treat human life more important than any amount of dope, right? So with the times, our tactics have changed as well. So they should definitely let us know as far as what they're doing so we can provide assistance. Because on a case like that, hey, if y'all absolutely have to do Springfield, y'all sit there and watch it. We can send some guys over. Or if y'all are going to do it, let us give you the all clear first so we can push armor your way to be able to support them. You know, from CID, I don't know how many warrants they do a year because um, we don't do every single one of them, obviously. But we always try to just push them the safest way they can do their warrants, if that makes sense. So okay. they should definitely brief us on any location they're going to be at um, during a brief, just so we know. Okay. And back to that point, I guess the, 
the Elliot was deemed at the time, I guess those were the, the two targets. Was it known at the time the targets were at that location or were there unknowns where... I want to say there was two main targets and forgive me, I don't remember the names. I want to say that they did a vehicle takedown on one or maybe two that left the location and one of the other targets, there was like three or four targets. I think at least one was in the house and I think two were taken down as we were in route or as we were working on the first resident, on the first house on Elliot. But the timing of that and I don't know which one was the main target versus the secondary target, but it provided like three or four different names. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned the email to uh, Sergeant Cassie about Springfield, and I, I guess he may have more intimate knowledge of that. But was that around the same time the other warrants came in, like a month prior to? Well, I was on a conference call with uh, Colonel Chavis, Major Gregory, Major Burbrink, and myself talking about debriefing this incident, kind of what we can learn from it, because I think there were some, I heard some things that came from the initial interviews from PIU um, that said SWAT and narcotics, or excuse me, CID weren't communicating effectively, and I was brought to my attention that maybe it was my fault, maybe it wasn't, so we had a clearing of the air. Um, that was the first time I was ever made aware of that email, because she provided a copy of it for me. But I had, I had, I don't think I ever received the initial email, and if we did, it was 30 days prior. So unless you mention it, mention it in a briefing or tell us in a subsequent meeting, we're not going to remember that you said Springfield a month earlier. Okay, and Colonel Chavis provided that. I don't know if it was email. her or Major Burbank. One of the two. Okay, so Major Burbank or she brought to my attention, hey, this this email existed 30 days or March. Not 30 days. One of the warrants, March 13th. March 13th. It may have been March 1st or 2nd. It may have been two weeks. Two weeks to three weeks. But I don't, I'd have to look through my email. I don't know that I received that email. I may have it. I have to double check. But that was the first time that I recognized that Springfield was mentioned. Okay. Well, Jason, you have anything else about Springfield? Yeah. yeah as far yeah. as that, you know, like, I guess you all had a meeting afterwards, like a debriefing meeting. I mean, Clearly, you you had some concerns that night. One hundred percent. Did you one is did you voice them that night to anyone, and who who did you voice them to, if any? We talked internally as a team, um, figuring that at some point we would be called in here because a we had the body cam footage, b I think we were the most unaffected by what happened because we were there after the fact. Obviously, we weren't there for the initial shooting, and generally my guys, because they're in more stressful situations, can process information and slow things down. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about it internally, um, yeah, 100%. Um, and, you know, that's why I was kind of alluding to earlier, like our priorities are people. Like dope's way down here. So that's why we move slower. That's why we mitigate our actions. Um, and going back, I know there's, it's really big in the media about the no-knock thing. So these no-knock warrants, if they provide me with a no-knock warrant, you know what we do? We knock an ounce. Okay, the only time we'll do a no-knock warrant is if we're, we will crest one if we're doing an explosive breach charge at the breach point where you can't make announcements, right? And we usually reserve those for homicide suspects. So we even take the extra step, yeah, it's an old rock wall, but we're still not going to announce our presence just because of the, the initial danger at the breach point. Well, that's actually a good question. Did CID request a no, or did, did you tell CID that you all requested a no-knock on Elliot? Did not. Um, we've done Elliot in the past. Elliot, when you enter the, the if y'all were, have you ever been to Elliot? You enter a common area, and that's where they do a lot of the, the drug sales and a lot of the drug users hang out at. Every time we've gone to that house, we've encountered people immediately at the threshold. We don't even enter the house. We, we called them out to us. We called every single person out to us on Elliot. I left that time, but the time before, call everybody out, send the robot in, and then we go in and secure it. So that, that house had, like, trapdoors and stuff, too. And had you had you known that, that CID was going to serve that warrant on, on Springfield, would you advise them no, not I'll, to do that? I would advise them 100% not to do it until we were done doing what we had to do. Like I said, we can't do every single. Uh, Thank God. We can't do every single war for them, and then, so if she was that low in the matrix, which I never saw that matrix, so frankly I can't speak to what it, she would have showed up as in the matrix at all. I don't know. Um, and I've told people like when you use a SWAT team, it's a higher level of force, so we can't do every single war the way we would do a SWAT war. But I most definitely would have told them, hey, wait till we're done and can move some armor to you, um, or. Give them alternate op op options. Hey, we can send four or five guys over there after the fact to, just to do a surround and call out because if the warrant's for money, which is my understanding of what it was, is if it's people and money in there, you can't really destroy money. They're not going to destroy money. Just call them out to you. Like, if you want to breach the door, breach the door, make announcements. This is the police, you know.
So we generally tend to treat ours more that way. It's just the way we operate tactically and the way CID operates tactically are just they're completely different. And not to beat a dead horse, but on the, the briefing to Elliot, there's no mention of Springfield. So is it safe to say no matrix or op plan, anything, or no knowledge whatsoever about a warrant being conducted at the same time at the Springfield? No, no whatsoever. I'll take a step further. I've never received a matrix from CID that we didn't do the warrant on. And that's a policy thing, so it's not a you all thing. But we, ne we I never received matrixes on the work that they do, only the ones that we do for them. What about the operations plan? Did y'all receive one on this? No. So nothing? And still haven't to this point? On Springfield, no. Okay. What about Elliot? Did you receive one there? El so when we do their warrants, we kind of do our own ops plan. So mm -hmm. if, if they provide us the information, like I said, going back to the past, about we wanted to get our own eyes on and look at it. So I would say the information they provide, we come up with our own operations plan because our planning process is more intensive than theirs. So mm -hmm. as long as they bring the warrant and the matrix, I mean, we get the plan to put it together ourselves because we're the ones that are going to be executing it. Okay. Uh, back out at Springfield, when you all arrived on scene, you had mentioned something. Uh, when you first arrived on scene, it was your initial thoughts that officers... Uh, we're receiving fire through a sliding glass door. Yes. Can um, you kind of expand so, on that a little yeah. bit? So or? as we were getting there, we hear that there's automatic gunfire. There's a rifle in play. There's a rifle in play. We kept on hearing that over and over again. So my assumption was when I saw the number of, of what I thought to be exit, initially exit bullet, bullet through the windows and sliding glass doors, I just assumed, I was like, hey, well, that's what they shot at as they're making their approach. And then I figure out, no, it's at the breach point. So then it becomes pretty readily avail apparent to me that those rounds, after three or four minutes, oh, they came from outside. So those rounds that went inside that I thought initially were coming out were actually going in the apartment. Okay. And you, you may or may not remember, because a while has gone past, but on that sliding glass door, do you remember, were there shades or anything there was, over that door, or could you see into the see apartment? I could not see anything in the apartment. I want to say it was those white vertical blinds, but I could be wrong. It was still, there was definitely a white barrier in that, and you couldn't see any of the windows either that I could that I could see. I mean, because we couldn't even see any light or darkness. It was just, like I said, just the white. I believe they're vertical blinds. Okay. And in your all's training and experience and training to the department, is it pretty much given that we're trained to, you have to uh, identify a target uh, as part of training and just kind of your all's continue, continued training? Yeah, 100%. I mean, target identification and, and knowing what your backdrop is are the, probably the two most important things as far as when you fire your weapon, um, 100%. Like, you have to know, A, what you're shooting at, B, what's in front of it, and B, what's behind it. And there's no other way you can operate. And this is a question I'm not sure you can answer or either you're the appropriate person to ask this, but, you know, since you have a lot of weapons training and experience, if if someone is to fire a weapon in an illuminated area into a darkened area, would that muzzle flash project into that dark area? Um, if it's covered by cloth, windows and stuff, no, you wouldn't see anything. Okay. All you're going to do is hear what would probably be a very rapid firing of gun that you could mistake for a rifle, maybe. I don't know. But you could definitely, you wouldn't be able to see it if, you're, if they're at the breach point. Because, again, like I said, initially we were like, oh, they're coming outside. And then we moved over, kind of saw the door. Oh, there's the door. And then they had worked on the Sergeant Manley right, like right in front of it. So I was like, okay. And that's when I got, like I said, the more information, oh, it happened over here. And one more question. So this, this table is about 36 inches wide. And, a, and the entry door at this apartment was 36 inches well, this, the biggest entry door they have. Is it practical or is it even common for not just SWAT? I mean, clearly SWAT works, they have different tactics, but for any, you know, CID unit, investigative unit, when they serve, when they do an entry into a house, would it be common for three people to be in what we consider the fatal funnel? Absolutely not, no. So you, in your nine, almost 20 years, have you ever seen where someone's punched out like this, Cover two, if we will. So first light cover two is punched out, <clears throat> maybe behind him a little bit, and then there's a third person between the first light and the cover two. Have I mean, you ever I, seen that? No, no, not not in any kind of scenario where you were training. Now I can't speak to what kind of stuff goes on the street, but no, you would <clears> never <throat> put you know 
yourself in that situation. But even, you know, in, in your experience and just, you know, I know you had experience in the second division impact or uh, flex platoon. Have you ever seen anyone on a police department do that? No, no. Uh, back to the scene on Springfield when you arrived, you mentioned uh, you'd learned Detective Cosgrove uh, actually had fired his weapon. Uh, and I think you may have said it and I, I missed it. Uh, you advised someone that he should probably be secured. Yes. Uh, who was that? I don't know. I mean, I may say some Lieutenant Hoover. Because um, it was kind of, because you had the third division major was there. And then you had their lieutenant. I don't know if Lieutenant Hoover was there from the beginning, but I, I remember saying, I believe it was the Lieutenant Hoover, man, you need to have him separated. He's too, he was too involved with what was going on when we got there. He needed to be checked out. Like, he needed to be off to the side. You know, the emotions, the adrenal dump, you know. He provided me with great information, don't get me wrong. He had the best intel, but he still needed to be out of, out of the mix. Okay, so I, at that point, the major of the division. He was already on scene when I got there. Um, they had another situation in the third that evening they called me about. Um, it didn't rise to our level of needing to assist, so we went ahead with the spring, or excuse me, with the warrants on Elliot. So by the time I got there, um, there was pro I mean, he was there. There was probably 70, 80 police cars. I mean, we had, we had to come from 24 block Elliot all the way. I mean, we were probably on the road for a good 20, 25 minutes, or 20 minutes just getting there to the Bearcat. It took us that long. So, yeah, he was already there. Okay. Other than... And how our structure on the department set up with officers, such detectives, sergeants, lieutenants, majors, and up above, uh, Lieutenant Hoover would have been in charge of that uh, activity or that warrant. If he was there for uh, the if he was, execution, yes. If he was there for the, mm -hmm. the beginning of it. Uh, But then it kind of gets murky whenever a major shows up. It's, hey, it's, those, it's not my unit, but it's your division, so then the whole ICS, you know, but. Okay. I lost, uh, forgot That's what right. I was going to ask. But. <laughs> Just a few more questions, LT. Sure. Are there any other, qu any other questions we, ha we have not asked you or any other information you have that may be beneficial to this case? I mean, just based upon what we saw that night, not having been privy to any of the investigation, just the, um, and not so much my interaction with Detective Hankinson, but with my guys, we just got the feeling that night that, you know, um, something really bad happened. And that the target identification, we don't think, and again, we didn't do the investigation, just based upon our initial, what we saw, what we were told, kind of, how we replayed the thing because we, we we want everybody to be safe, right? That's our ultimate goal. Is we don't want to we don't want us to get hurt, innocent people, and even the bad guys. I mean, if no one's got to die, they don't have to die. Like that's fourteen thousand dollars isn't worth it. Any amount of dope's not worth it either. Um, as we debriefed and kind of looked over, it was just it was just an egregious act. I mean, from our perspective, if that's in fact what happened, I mean, if other details come to light, it is what it is. But it's just it seemed like that there's no target identification whatsoever for those rounds that were shot outside the apartment. Any follow -up? On Elliot, who was in charge other than you all? Can you think of any command who was in charge down there uh, from CID or? Sergeant Fawn was there. I don't remember. Was Lieutenant Huckleberry there? I don't think he was. I know, I think the Colonel Chavis was out with him that night, though. I mean, I think she was out riding around. She may have been on Ellie with us. Um, I don't know if Major Burbank was out or not. So they, none of them came to our briefing. The only, the only person from our co or CID that came to our briefing was Detective James. He's the only person that we knew for a fact was there, and then he told us, hey, I got Sergeant Fall on the backside, and he may have mentioned some other people that were there, but they were already in place and had the eye because of those cars. So I know James is the only one that came to actually um, Springfield, or uh, excuse me, to brief us at Naval Warners. Okay, which isn't uncommon. It's if, not uncommon. If he's the lead investigator. No, not uncommon whatsoever. We actually prefer out. to have less people in there because it, so. if you have 30 people in there, it gets two out anyway and you can't hear the brief. And... Okay. So. Is there anything you want to state for the record before we end? No. Is everything you told me the truth to the best of your knowledge? Yes. We will now conclude the statement. Time now is approximately...
13, 28 hours.